Hello and welcome to another one of Mr. Deeping Science Lessons. For today's session you're going to need a book and a pen and in your book I'd like to get down today's title which is Disruption to Food Webs. For your Star Trek activity I'd like to suggest how plastics in the ocean can lead to increased plastics in the human diet. I'm going to put 5 seconds on the clock and if you need more time pause the video and when you're finished we'll go through the answers together. Did you make your suggestion? Did you suggest that things in the ocean may eat the plastics? And did you also suggest that people eat the things from the ocean? Throughout the course of this lesson, we're going to look at this in a lot more detail. We are also going to be describing how our food webs are affected by changes in producer and consumer populations. We're going to define interdependence using an example. And we're going to explain how bioaccumulation can lead to tertiary consumers becoming poisoned. We're going to begin with a recap of some of the terminology we learned last lesson and that we're going to be using frequently in this lesson. In this food web, I would like to identify the consumers, the producers, the herbivores and the carnivores. I'm going to put 5 seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Did you get your answers? So our consumers are anything in our food web that eats something else in our food web and these are easily identified because they're always at the end of an arrow. Our producers are always at the bottom of our food web and that's because they create their own glucose by a process called photosynthesis. Our herbivores are things that only consume plants, the producers. In our food web it's the rabbit, the caterpillar and the snail. Our carnivores, our meat eaters, are animals that only eat other consumers. In this case it's going to be the fox, the frog, the vole, the sparrow and the sparrowhawk. Now we're going to look at what would happen if there was a disruption to our food web. Imagine what's going to happen if all these plants are wiped out in a fire. How is this going to affect all the other animals? Our rabbits, our caterpillars and our snail aren't going to have anything to eat, so eventually they will die out. This also means that the frog, the vole and the sparrow aren't going to have anything to eat and they too will die. And with all these primary and secondary consumers wiped out, that means our apex predator like the fox and the sparrowhawk are also going to die because there's not going to be any food. So the producer is the most important aspect of any food web. For your task, what I'd like you to do is to suggest what would happen to all the other animals in this food chain if our sparrows were to die of a new disease. And if you still want a challenge, I'd also like to suggest which animal's extinction would have the smallest impact on this food web. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Did you get an answer? If our sparrowhawk became extinct, then our sparrowhawk numbers might also go down because they've got less food to eat. Because there's less sparrowhawks, the number of frogs and voles may increase. And let's not forget that those sparrows also eat those snails, so if you've got less sparrows, you're going to have more snails. Now there is multiple answers to this, and I'm going to go through another scenario. So our sparrows become extinct. That means our number of snails go up because there's nothing eating them. But instead of our sparrowhawk numbers decreasing, they're going to eat more voles and more frogs to keep the number of sparrowhawks up. Now, because we've got no sparrows, less voles and less frogs, that could mean that we've got more caterpillars. And ultimately this could lead to less plants and less rabbits and less foxes. In reality, if you take something out of the food web, eventually the population of all the other organisms will become stable. So now we have described how a food web is affected by changes in producer and consumer populations. If a producer population is affected, it can be devastating for the rest of the food web. If a consumer population is affected, it will affect the food web, but eventually the populations of all the other organisms will become stable. Next we're going to look at something called interdependence. Now the number of each of these different species within this habitat is called a population. So you'll have a population of foxes, you'll have a population of sparrowhawks, and if you have a collection of all of these populations that's called a community. Now these populations are dependent on one another for their food, and this is an example of interdependence. But, inter the, but interdependence doesn't just involve the populations within a food web. Bees pollinate many plants and grasses, and without them, our producers cannot reproduce. For your next task, what I'd like to do is to suggest the effects on the populations in this food web if the number of bees decreased. 
I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. And if you need more time, pause the video. And when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Did you get your answer? So this falling number of bees can lead to a decrease in the amount of producers being pollinated and reproduced. This leads to decreased numbers in plants. And if you decrease the number of plants, that means our rabbits, caterpillars and snails aren't going to have as much to eat, so their numbers will go down. That means our frogs, our voles and our sparrows are going to have less to eat, so their numbers are going to go down. And our fox and our sparrow hawk are going to have less to eat, and their numbers are going to go down. So now we've had a look at what interdependence is, using an example on how animals rely on each other for food within their food web, and how it can be influenced by animals not in the food web. Next, we're going to have a look at something called bioaccumulation using an example. A farmer treats his crops with pesticides. Now we're going to be representing this pesticide with these orange dots, and you can see that when the snail begins to eat the plant, that pesticide is also transferred to the snail. And over the course of that snail's lifetime, it's going to be consuming a lot of pesticide, which could ultimately kill our snail. Now if our sparrow was to eat that snail, or to eat the dead snail which had been poisoned by the pesticide, that pesticide will be transferred to the sparrow. And over the course of that sparrow's lifetime, it's going to eat a lot of these pesticide contaminated snails. And that pesticide is going to build up in our sparrow. This accumulation of chemicals in a single population is known as bioaccumulation. So when the snails were eating the plants, it was building up in the snail population, that was bioaccumulation. When our sparrow was eating our snails and that pesticide was being transferred from the snails to the sparrow, that was bioaccumulation. This accumulation of chemicals as we go through the food chain is called biomagnification. So we started off with a very small concentration of pesticide in our plants, and as we go up the food chain, that concentration of poison increases. For our next task, we're going to be using our food chain, and you can see that I've got a concentration of pesticide here on our plant, 0.0004 parts per million. Now I want to know, if the caterpillar eats 20 leaves in its lifetime, how many parts per million will our caterpillar have consumed? After you've done that, after you've done that, I want you to calculate how many parts per million the sparrow would eat if it ate 840 caterpillars in its lifetime. And after you've finished that, I'd also like to know how many parts per million. And after you've calculated that, I'd like to know how many parts per million our sparrow hawk would consume if it ate 120 sparrows in its lifetime. If you really want a challenge, I also want you to suggest why these figures may actually be smaller than the ones that you're going to calculate. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. And if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got your calculations? So our caterpillar eats 20 leaves in its lifetime, and every leaf has 0 0.0004 parts per million. So we're going to need to multiply that 0 0.0004 parts per million by 20 to give us 0 0.008. We're going to make the assumption that every caterpillar is contaminated with this 0.008 parts per million of pesticide. If our sparrow eats 840 caterpillars in its lifetime, we need to take that 0.008 and multiply it by 840 to give us 6.72 parts per million. We're then going to assume that every sparrow is contaminated with 6.72 parts per million of pesticide. Our sparrow hawk eats 120 sparrows in its lifetime, so we need to take this 6.72 and multiply it by 120 to give us 806.4 parts per million. This represents the bioaccumulation in the sparrowhawk population. This is also an example of biomagnification, because when we're at the bottom of the food chain, we've got a very low concentration of pesticide, 0.0004, and when we get to the top of the food chain, that has magnified to 806.4 parts per million. Now there are some reasons why these figures may be smaller than what we've calculated. Not every plant, caterpillar and sparrow is going to be contaminated with the same amount of pesticide, it could be a lot lower. Also, these toxins may not be absorbed by the body when the animal eats it. And when these toxins are absorbed, it's possible that they can be metabolized and then excreted from the body. Now this is a very high concentration of pesticide, and you can see how this bioaccumulation can lead to the poisoning of our tertiary consumers and our apex predators. So now we can explain how this bioaccumulation can lead to our tertiary consumers becoming poisoned. 
I've got one more thing I want you to think about before we wrap this lesson up. Using your new knowledge of bioaccumulation and biomagnification, I want you to have another go at this question. How can plastics in the ocean lead to increased plastics in the human diet? And if you want a challenge, I'd also like to know how it can be prevented. I hope you've had a great lesson and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the lesson. If you found it useful, don't forget to press the like button. And why don't you subscribe and press the bell icon as well so you know when the next lesson's available. You can also support me on Patreon and you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and I appreciate all the support. And I'll see you next time.